Why are summers at the Shalom Hartman Institute so special? Because that's when Jewish leaders and learners, like you and me, travel to Jerusalem to wrestle with big ideas and study with Hartman's inspiring faculty. The Shalom Hartman Institute is a pluralistic think tank and educational center for the Jewish people. Our scholars draw on 3,000 years of Jewish wisdom to develop the ideas we need to face today's challenges. This summer, the pandemic has prevented us from traveling, but it doesn't prevent us from learning together. Welcome. Join hundreds of Jewish leaders for All Together Now, a month-long celebration of ideas from the Shalom Hartman Institute. From now until July the 23rd, come learn with us in this moment of crisis and opportunity. Good evening. Erev Tov, Masail Khir. Welcome. I'm Siona Koenig Yair, the Vice President of the Hartman Institute here in Jerusalem and Director of the Israeli Jewish Identity Center here at the Hartman Institute. The Shalom Hartman Institute is a pluralistic think tank and educational center. Our mission is to strengthen Jewish peoplehood, Israeli identity and pluralism, to enhance the Jewish and democratic character of Israel and to ensure that Judaism is a compelling force for good in the 21st century. We're here at the Hartman campus in Jerusalem. Welcome to this session on Israel after Corona, a new relationship between Arab Israelis and Jewish Israelis. We'll be discussing today with two of my favorite colleagues and prominent actors in this field, Yasa and Muhammad, both of whom are key players and very active in the area of Jewish and Arab relationships in Israel. Yassi Kleina Levy is a senior fellow at the Hartman Institute in Jerusalem. Together with Imam Abdul Antapeli, he co directs the Institute's Muslim Leadership Initiative. Yassi is an author. His first book, At the Entrance to the Garden of Eden, tells the story of his journey into the Palestinian community. Many years later, in his book, Letters to My Palestinian Neighbor, Yossi shares his narrative with his Palestinian neighbors to complete this journey. Yossi writes for the op-ed pages of leading American newspapers and is a frequent commentator on Middle East affairs for international media. He has been active in Middle East reconciliation work, born and raised in Brooklyn. He has a BA in Jewish studies from Brooklyn College and an MS in journalism from Northwestern University. Yossi moved to Israel in 1982 and lives in Jerusalem with his wife, Sarah, and their children. Muhammad Darasha is a Shalom Hartman Institute faculty member. He is the Director of Planning, Equality, and Shared Society at the Givat Chaviva Educational Center. Muhammad is considered a leading expert on Jewish-Arab relations and has presented lectures worldwide and nationwide in different forums. He previously served as a co-director of the Abraham Fund Initiative. He was the election campaigns manager for the Democratic Arab Party and later the United Arab Party list. In 2008, Muhammad was elected as a city council member in his hometown, Iqsal. He holds a Bachelor of Arts from the Hebrew University in Jerusalem and a Master's of Arts in Public Administration from Hartford University. Muhammad lives in Iqsal with his wife and children. Welcome to this conversation. In our discussion today, we want to talk about the developments over this past pandemic in Israel. What has it meant for the relationships between Israeli Arabs and Israeli Jews in Israel? For one of our programs, the Mina Beirut Shared Society Program here in Israel, we have felt a larger demand from educational change agents, both on the Jewish side and the Arab side, to bring the community together. We have felt a demand for a more value-based discourse at this time of crisis. And I feel like this is an opportunity in Israeli society to really define or redefine the relationship between Israeli Jews and Israeli Arabs. And I want to ask you first, Muhammad, to say a little bit about what you think about the opportunity that's presented itself during the corona pandemic. 
Masail Khair and uh, Erev Tov. Uh, good evening. I think that uh, in a way the corona uh, pandemic created a rare opportunity uh, in Israel for Jewish and Arab citizens. For the first time, Jews and Arabs were uh, subjects of uh, this attack. Uh, both uh, communities uh, were, were basically uh, shared the same seat of the victims of this attack, but at the same time, shared the same seat of uh, uh, combating this attack, uh, especially uh, the front line, which was uh, the hospitals and the medical staff and the emergency staff. Mm -hmm. uh, there, the presence of Arab uh, citizens among the medical teams is even much higher than their percentage in Israeli society in general, and their presence uh, was much more significant uh, than uh, uh, their real size in society. And most Israeli Jews were exposed to the fact that Arab citizens are fighting alongside with them. And most Arab citizens also experienced the state, especially in the military teams that came to assist in distributing food and other emergency teams, felt that the state was coming to their aid. These are rare opportunities. This is an experience we haven't had before. And I think it's, it is creating some kind of collective mutual experience that ultimately sinks in our mutual joint psyche of creating a joint identity. Usually identities are created as a result of joint experiences and sometimes experiences are not nice experiences. This is not so nice experience which is the pandemic but the combating it together uh, is the nice part of it, is the, is the element that shows that we share an enemy but also we share uh, fighting uh, together. We were soldiers in the same battle against the same enemy. This is not something that we've experienced before. And I think that uh, ultimately this creates a bit of a greater value of Arab citizens in the Israeli wider scene, in the Israeli public space, in the medical uh, public space. But it also uh, shows the Arab citizens that uh, they themselves have a greater, greater value and role to play in the larger Israeli society. I think that the self-worth of Arab citizens uh, was increased significantly during this pandemic, mainly, as I said, because of the uh, oversized presentation in the medical teams. I hope this will last for some time, but unfortunately, uh, we're also beginning to see that the memory of uh, the decision makers, the government in Israel is not long enough. They quickly forget about this, so when they came about distributing money and support. We'll get to that. Oh, we'll get to that. We'll get to that in a few minutes. But in the meantime, you do want to share with us a video that you yourself put together around this issue. Is that right? Indeed. Yeah. I, I tried in this video to capture uh, this wonderful shared experience, this wonderful experience of collective joint mission mm. of Jews and Arabs. And so let's watch it together. It's uh, six people who are Jews and Arabs who were in the front line and actually they're still in the front line. The pandemic is still with us. Thank you very much, Muhammad. I think that we are very close to each other, but we are very close to each other. I think that the situation is very close to the Arabs, Muslims, Jews, Dutch. The corona has been a great deal from the whole society. كان في نوع من التفاعل لفجأة تنسى كل الأمور اللي هي بتكون من برا أو كل الأمور أو الاختلافات السياسية كان كان في نوع من التركيز على هدف واحد.
Yes, I want to ask you about this uh, opportunity that we have in your personal experience over the last uh, few weeks, especially in light of where you live. Well, uh, before I answer your question, I would just like to say how struck I was, uh, Muhammad, by the language that you used to describe this, that Jews and Arabs were soldiers together on the front line. Now, this is, this is truly a unique moment in the history of our relationship, because if, if, if anything divides Arabs and Jews in this country, it's the military experience. And this was the first crisis in Israel's history that one could define as truly existential, life and death, that was not related to the conflict, that wasn't security related. And it was our first civil or civic crisis. And what's interesting especially is that if there was any sector of Israeli society that was positioned to respond to a civic crisis, it would be our, our healthcare system, because that is by far the most integrated uh, between Arabs and Jews in Israel, maybe the only truly integrated system in Israel. I, that's my impression. Well, and we also are integrated in crime and in construction. Okay, so uh, so leaving out the crime best, will... The best integrated sector. <laughs> <laughs> the, the most positive integrated uh, sector. There, there's a lot of collaboration in crime. And, uh, right. So the, the, that, that sense that, uh, that you know, 20 plus percent of Israeli doctors are Arab, 25 percent of our nurses. 28. 28, and over 50 percent of pharmacists. 55. 55. And so... The healthcare system was ready, mobilized to respond. And in that sense, I really feel this has been uh, an extraordinary opportunity for Israel. And you asked me about my own personal circumstance. Uh, I live in a, uh, in a building in Jerusalem where half the families happen to be Jewish and half the families happen to be Arab, Arab-Israeli. Um, families who came from the north for the most part and work as doctors and lawyers in the city. And relations in, in our neighborhood have, have always been cordial. Um, Can you say where that is, the neighborhood? It's in French Hill. And, and, uh, and cordial, not intimate. We, we, we're, we're all members of the same housing committee, we all, and we get to see each other's homes once a year when we have a meeting. But uh, that's, how it's, that's how it's been. And I really feel something has shifted in the last few months. There's a sense of we're not just, we're not just neighbors by default. We're actually neighbors. We actually really all belong to this same physical building, <laughs> and, and by extension, and I use my building as a metaphor, it's, we, we share the same house. And, uh, and so what I've, what I've felt in my own personal life is, I would say, an augmenting of this sense of, 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 of commonality. And, uh, and it's been a, a, a very moving process to see this happen. If I may add yes, just sure. one more thing, I think that you know, ultimately, uh, this is not going to go down the drain. I mean, those feelings, those experiences are not just temporary experiences. When, when you talk about the fabric of creating a society, there is a new society that is being created. It's not that Jewish society is separate from the Arab society. It's a Jewish and Arab societies learning how to interact with each other on, on the concept of maybe it's interdependency, maybe it's mutual need, maybe it's mutual interest but it's beyond the traditional identity politics that manages usually Jewish-Arab relations. We're going through a stage of interdependency based on maybe human interest, uh, maybe on uh, health interest right now, but I think the real life is teaching us that there are needs that are beyond the political disputes that we have on, on the issues such as the nation state law, the identity of the state, the national anthem, flag, and things like that. We're beginning to learn how to live together. And we're seeing on the ground different things. We're Absolutely. seeing different things that are happening that aren't uh, coming down from the government or that aren't really being forced upon us, but rather 
bottom up. And these are bottom up. And these are cumulative. Yeah. It creates a ground, an atmosphere. Mm -hmm. And they happen so, despite the government sometimes. Despite the government. So I would say that these are like these this is sort of the silver lining maybe here in Israel uh, in terms of the pandemic. At the same time, I think that we see also challenges all around us. And uh, one of the challenges that I find interesting is the challenge that uh, we're not really learning from our previous mistakes. What do I mean by that? I think that the level of infections in certain areas that are populated by Israeli Arabs have been lower statistically than in other places in Israel. And I was wondering why we're not learning from those examples. Um, how to lower the infection rates in, in other cities, in other geographical areas in Israel. And I'm sure that you both have different thoughts around uh, the challenges that still remain. And I'm gonna ask you, Mohammed, again to start. Tell us what you, where you see the challenges. You already gave us a, a preview of that before, and then we'll go on to Yossi and ask him as well. Well, first of all, as, as you mentioned, uh, Tiona, uh, there is something to learn uh, about how to keep this pandemic in some kind of control. Uh, you know, everyone says reduce social interaction. Mm. Well, in the Arab community, it's not like that. It's not reducing, but it's limiting it. Uh, so, you know, in our family compound, for example, we are about 25 people with my mother that lives with us. We're not reducing social contact within that nucleus part of the community, but we're reducing contact with everyone else. And there's only one or two people from that compound that gets out to interact with the rest of, of society. And I think that uh, we, we also feel we have sort of our own comfort zone in those small compounds that we do not really need to socialize with that many others. So maybe the traditional lifestyle of, uh, of uh, tribal families, maybe that really is a way to fight the pandemic. So the Arab community can contribute from its social traditions that uh, you don't really need to disconnect yourself just for the, to the level of the individual to fight the pandemic. But it's, it's a smaller nucleus or a bit bigger nucleus groups that can uh, uh, maintain and protect themselves. I think that the Arab community in, in this case also uh, was able to hear and translate uh, the recommendations of the government very, very quickly. Also because there is such a high percentage of medical staff within the community itself. Mm -hmm. We have more than the average percentage of doctors among our community, so they know to talk, how to talk Arabic also. They're not only able to talk Hebrew and, uh, and treat Jews in, in, the, in, uh, in hospitals, they know how to talk Arabic to the Arab community. And uh, so the percentage of warning voices in the Arab community was definitely much higher than the percentage of warning voices, for example, as in the Haredi community. <coughs> That's a very interesting point, because in the ultra-Orthodox community, we saw, and I don't know if our uh, participants know this, we saw a much higher rate of infection, and I think that one of uh, the conclusions was that we didn't reach them in that way possible. So what you're saying is completely relevant. And unfortunately, though, uh, you know, some parts of the government did catch up and mm -hmm. were able to catch up with some services to the Arab community and making very good collaboration uh, with Arab municipalities that uh, really played a fantastic role uh, uh, in fighting the pandemic. Uh, but other government agencies completely uh, uh, kept uh, going through the same circle of stupidity, unfortunately. Uh, they found the, the way, the tricky ways to still discriminate against Arab communities in budgets uh, in order to compensate municipalities uh, for losses of income. Uh, some agencies, especially Interior Ministry, unfortunately, did not rise for the occasion, and uh, they still thought in the same old traditional way. So yes, maybe society is learning the lesson, mm -hmm. but it seems that government is much slower than the, the people, much slower than the Jewish people and the Arab people in Israel in understanding that we have an opportunity here that we can build on. Uh, in, in, the, in the private sector, I, I would say, that uh, we're beginning to see also some nice, <coughs> in the private sector, I would say, that we're beginning to see, we begin to see some nice outreach towards the Arab community in recognizing the, <coughs> in recognizing the very special needs of the Arab community 
we went through the month of uh, Ramadan, mm. and uh, the month of Ramadan required different behavior. Yeah. Uh, so all shops, for example, were closed after 6 p.m. in Arab towns, which meant that Arab consumers had to travel to Jewish neighboring towns uh, to do their purchases. And quickly we saw that those businesses, Jewish businesses, knew how to adapt in providing products that are relevant to the Ramadan experience in Arab towns and villages. Amazing. A lot of new things that developed very, very quickly as, as a result of a natural reaction to the situation and not really that much deep research thinking of, of how to adapt it, but re recognizing an opportunity and grabbing it. I think one opportunity that wasn't grabbed maybe, and uh, hopefully also you can comment on this, is, is the political uh, issue of forming the government. And while we saw something historical start to happen here, we're not there yet. Well, it's interesting that a, a transformative moment socially coincided with a potentially transformative moment politically, which did not actually uh, carry through, but it almost did. And in Israel, that counts as, as, as a, as in its way, as a historical event. And I'm speaking, of course, about the negotiations to form a government when uh, Benny Gantz, uh, the head of the Blue and White Party, uh, entered into what appeared to be serious negotiations to draw at least uh, outside support for a minority government from the United Arab list. This is the first time that we even got close to, to the table. Yeah. And so something, something happened. And again, you know, Muhammad, you're speaking about psychological transformations. I think that, that we, we broke a taboo on both sides. And, and each side, I think, um, felt maybe this is going too far. Maybe we really can't do this. Maybe uh, we can't form a government with a party that most Israeli Jews uh, see as pro-terrorist. Uh, and maybe on the United Arab list, we can't, we can't support a government headed by uh, three, no less than three IDF former commanders in chief. I, I, think, I think it got a little scary for both sides. What do we do, for example, uh, if there's a government headed by blue and white uh, that then decides to respond to, to rocket fire and attack Gaza? Will the United Arab list be able to continue to support from the outside? Uh, these, are, these are complicated questions that may not have any answers, but for me what was so moving about that moment was that we had this tantalizing vision of what normalcy could look like. That here you have the third largest political party. It's the most natural thing in the world. They both despise the prime minister. They both have a shared interest. Why not create a united front? Now, compare that to something that was happening on the right at the same time which was Netanyahu and his supporters were saying something that I've never heard before. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I have never heard an Israeli prime minister say, I won the election because I got a majority Jewish votes. Maybe they thought so in the past, but I've, I never, we never heard it from Menachem Begin. We never even heard it from, from Sharon, but we heard it from, from Netanyahu. Also in 1996, he said the same. And in 1996, right, it, it's, it's right, the same person. And, uh, and so this, this for me really presented two very stark visions of, uh, of what a future Israeli politics could look like. It's either going to be, well, the Arabs can vote, but your votes don't really matter because in the end, all that really matters are Jewish votes. Or Benny Gantz, who almost took a courageous step and, uh, and said, well, I'm, in, I'm the prime minister of Israel. I want to be the prime minister of Israel. And uh, these are Israeli votes. And so it was, it was an extraordinary political moment converging with an extraordinary social moment. 
Do you want to say something? Yes, please. Uh, and I think that uh, two things I would say. First of all, I agree totally that uh, uh, there was a historic moment that the issue of Arab political participation in the governance and mm. political decision making has made the highest surfacing possible, the highest uh, uh, time, the highest portfolio ever in the history of, of Israel. It was part of the discourse regard, about uh, uh, the creation of the government and uh, it was even a part of the discourse during the elections campaign. The joint Arab list was saying we want to be in. Uh, and uh, the music that we were hearing from blue and white at the time was also rather positive music. But I think where I disagree in, in, on this issue is that the disappointment today within the Arab community is as equivalent to the expectations. You know, when, you have, when you have high expectations, your disappointment becomes uh, uh, also higher. Uh, so the disappointment from not materializing this sort of promise or expectation uh, has created a deep scar uh, among many of the Arab voters that are questioning whether they even want to vote the next elections. Uh, because the failure to uh, fulfill this uh, and materialize this promise uh, showed some kind of a glass ceiling that we were not able to break. My, my perspective is that ultimately this will be broken. And I also would add that the failure of this government, despite the fact that it did not include the joint Arab list, they could have uh, appointed an Arab minister who is not part of this list. Mm. They could have appointed one or two director generals directors of different ministries, and they did not deliver on that either, despite the fact that they spoke about it. They promised to uh, amend the nation state law. They promised to present a law for equality uh, as a basic law. And uh, they completely disregarded uh, the, all of these topics. And the, the Arab citizens were left with the feeling that, politically, this glass ceiling is even more obvious now. I mean, maybe we were uh, hoping to reach it and break it, but now we realize that, that it's a solid glass. It's not a thin glass that is easy to break. May I, I ask Please. you whether there is any talk in the Arab community about the time for a joint Arab-Jewish party that would be based on um, agreement to disagree about certain questions related to Zionism, uh, for example, but that has a shared vision of a civic Israeli identity. Well, you see, that talk is there, and it's, it's loud in the Arab community, uh, for two reasons. One is uh, the realization in realpolitik that uh, an Arab list, doesn't matter how big it is, mm -hmm. its effectiveness is limited its ability to translate the masses, the power of the masses in the Arab community into real impact on decision-making in Israel, as long as you stay within your own bubble, it's limited. And most of the voters uh, of, to the joint list were not political members of those, those parties. So maybe the political members are still committed to the party line, but most, most of the voters voted because they felt that the joint list is going to take their vote and bring it to the government table, bring the, <coughs> bring the joint list to the, uh, to the governance structure and be effective, and they're not able to do that. So what's the way out? The way out is collaboration with the Jewish political force that is able to uh, join hands, maybe not with the kind of complete agreement on ideological basis, but at least on some kind of interests. The mainstream Jewish force. Mainstream, because we've, we, we know that the ability of, of merits and traditional left in Israel is as limited as the Arab voters. Uh, they, they have been giving a lot of fantastic, beautiful promises. So to Arab ears, they sound very nice and very beautiful. But when it comes to translation, we haven't seen anything from the left. The left has not been able to deliver to the Arab uh, community interests any, any significant strategic uh, 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 accomplishment. 
And uh, that's why, you know, if we're talking about the joint Jewish-Arab political partnership, it has to come from mainstream Arab and mainstream Jewish mm -hmm. communities. Absolutely. And that's the bridge that is still missing. I think there's more readiness in the Arab community for that than that is in the Jewish community. In, in the Jewish center, I think they are still trying to focus on, on, or focus on how to, do they take votes from the right wing. And that keeps them moving into the right direction while uh, missing the opportunity of extending a hand to our partners uh, in the upcoming elections. I want to ask you another question. I think at this present time, a lot of people are asking themselves, how is the annexation going to impact and influence those relationships between Israeli Jews and Arabs? And just continuing this previous point that you've been talking about, let's elaborate on, uh, on that. Yossi, I'll turn to you first, please. When I look at the map of opportunities that Israel has at this time, whether it is uh, breakthroughs in the Arab-Jewish relationship within the state of Israel, uh, whether it's new relations with the Saudis, the Gulf states, and a possible long-term vision of a regional peace in which, which I think really is the only hope in the end for creating a Palestinian state within a regional context, uh, then for me, annexation seems to be uh, doubly and triply inexplicable. Uh, I see absolutely no benefit, and I'm speaking, speaking now in purely Israeli self-interest, I see no benefit for annexation and I see only the downside. And I'm not even speaking now directly about Israeli-Palestinian relations. I'm speaking about the, the how, how would you say, atifa, the, uh, the envelope, the envelope. And, uh, and so I, I, I am desperately worried about the impact of annexation on these multiple relationships. And this is a very fragile moment in the history of this conflict, in the history of our place in, in the Middle East. And, and it could really go in different directions. And um, I just, uh, I, you know, I'm, I, I voted for blue and white. And, and when Gantz went into the government, I said, okay, he's going to to put a break on the anti-democratic slide, the decline of the right. And to some extent, I think that happened, that blue and white took on, took over the, the justice ministry. There were a few other positive moves. But if blue and white doesn't take a stand on annexation, and this is its first major test, then I, I question the purpose of blue and white altogether. Mohammed? Well, I think the annexation, uh, if it happens, uh, by the way, I don't think, I, I wouldn't even call it annexation. It's uh, stealing lands from a future Palestinian state to up to the point of making that future Palestinian state almost impossible uh, to create. Mm -hmm. uh, it's taking over land that uh, was supposed to uh, create the uh, territorial opportunity for the Palestinians to materialize their goal of fulfilling their national uh, aspiration for statehood and uh, making a future Palestinian state look like maybe Swiss cheese with lots of holes and uh, with big cage surrounding them. Uh, which in my view promises the continuity of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict for another 100 years. Uh, it's not going to, be, you know, it's not going to be a step in uh, the direction of resolving the conflict. It's a step in the direction of renewing the conflict. Uh, for the last uh, few uh, decades, we were under the concept that uh, a two-state solution is probably the only working potential solution for is the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And uh, despite the difficulties in implementing that, I think that uh, the majority of Israelis and Palestinians thought that this is the most uh, pragmatic resolution. And I think that the annexation step is going to take 
that opportunity off the table. The How future, is it going to impact internally the Israeli, Jewish, and Arab relationships to your, to your better understanding? I think it's, uh, uh, politically it's going to uh, show that there's no Jewish partner for peace. Uh, this is a unilateral decision of uh, maximizing the use of power that the Jews have in this region with the support of the Trump administration, uh, showing as if the only thing that matters is your power to uh, take action and fulfill steps. And uh, it basically says to the Arab citizens, it's only a matter of power. You don't have power now. Wait for the moment that you'll have power. Uh, so I don't think you'll see an immediate reaction of the Arab citizens, uh, but uh, in, in the long run, I, I think it will have a real impact uh, that uh, it, it says that Jews are not here to coexist with the Arabs or the Palestinians. Jews are here to look for the right moment to capture more, to take more, to oppress more, to control more. And this is not good for the Jews in my view. I think this is not good for the yeah. Jews. This is not good for the Arabs for sure. Do you want to comment? So, yourself? Yeah, yeah, two points. Uh, one is that while I believe that any form of annexation is unacceptable, I do think there are gradations of, uh, of threat here. Uh, annexing the Jordan Valley with 55,000 Palestinians and not giving them citizenship creates a certain dynamic. Um, uh, symbolically annexing uh, one or two settlement blocks, which is what they're talking about now. I think the symbolism is very, is destructive, but in practice it won't change much on the ground because Malea Dumim, for example, or Gush Etzion, these are areas that are not going to be evacuated. So when you talk about creating Swiss cheese, that, that map already exists. But the question is, if it's extending Israeli law to all the settlements, or is Netanyahu going to, as we say, come down from the tree? And I don't even know if there's an expression like that in English anymore. I might. <laughs> but climb it's a, down the ladder. <laughs> climbing, down, <laughs> climbing down from the ladder. And, uh, and so that's, that's, one, that's one point. We, we have to really wait and see what kind of annexation happens. Uh, again, if it happens, it, if it happens, and 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 how severe, or when it happens, or when, and uh, so, yeah. And the second point is that, uh, and, and here, uh, Muhammad, you and I disagree, uh, is what is why we've come to this point, and on the Israeli Jewish side. The notion that there is a Palestinian partner waiting for us to make peace is something that is um, um, that lacks credibility, and and one of the reasons I believe that we've gotten to this point, where you have a government that feels it can implement a policy, which most Israelis don't really care about. That's what we've seen from the polls. That's the irony but also don't feel strongly enough about to oppose. That dynamic is a result of the deep sense of distrust and disappointment that is really mutual between Palestinians and Israelis. Yeah. Well, one more quick thing. I think sure. that what this plan is presenting is uh, basically elimination of something that in the, in the eyes of the Arab citizens and the Palestinians was something sacred, you know, something that the issue of 1967 borders. What this plan is saying, nothing is sacred. Everything is on the table. Mm. So if everything is on the table, many are beginning to say, okay, so let's go for real partition of populations. Let's go to the 1967, 1947 yeah. partition plan. The Galilee is with the majority Palestinian population. Mm. So let's, and such as the Negev, also parts of the Negev, so let's extend this population uh, redrawing of a map to the 1947 uh, issues. I, wanna, I, I think, I think that, that uh, there are Israeli polit Jewish politicians who would be partners for that, like yeah. Lieberman, for example. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and I think we would have some people who would be partners, and we would have some very, very great opposition to that as well. And 
when I'm thinking about the last few months during the pandemic and relationships in Israel between Israeli Jews and Arabs, I'm wondering about a joint Israeli identity. And this is a big leap from the previous question around annexation. But I'm wondering around that. And I've heard a lot from Arabs and from Jews here in Israel about what really matters to them on a day-to-day -day basis. And going back to the beginning of our conversation, it's a joint, joint living conditions here in Israel. And thinking about that, I want to ask both of you, is there a possibility, after everything we've spoken about, for a joint Israeli identity? Is there some sort of thinking around that? What, where, can you wrap your heads around that for a minute? Yes, I think there is. So I'm, on one level, you know, despite everything I said, I am optimistic mm. because I think we're accumulating those mutual uh, experiences uh, and they are able to identify a lot of what I call islands of success in, in, their, in, in interacting with each other and being able to work together, study together, uh, uh, fight pandemic together. Uh, it's worth something significant. It's creating this kind of mutual experience that ultimately I would say creates this civic identity, strengthens the, the joint Israeli identity. But where I uh, have an issue with the Israeli identity is that most Israeli Jews would say Israeli identity is pretty much uh, uh, similar to Jewish identity. It's exclusive to, to the level of Jewishness only. Uh, where I think that most Arab citizens think Israeli identity has to mature or to expand to be a bit more elastic in its nature, to include also Palestinian citizens of Israel. Mm -hmm. So that an Arab citizen will feel comfortable enough to say, I'm a Palestinian citizen of Israel, and feel that the Israeliness is able to uh, embrace that kind of identity and not feel that it's poking the eye of Israelis. And I think that we're still you know, far from that. I think most Israelis would see the term Palestinian citizens as intimidating uh, uh, or maybe uh, scary uh, to, to, some, to their own uh, collective Israeli Jewish identity, while most Arab citizens say, well, I am Palestinian. That is, that is who I am. That's who I am. I'm not going to stop being Palestinian in order for Isra to become Israeli. They think that the Israeli identity needs to expand and mature so that when, when we speak about the state of Israel, it's not only the state of the Jewish people, it's also the state of its citizens. Most Arab citizens do not see it as either or. They see it as both, the combination of both things together. Yeah, I'm interested in hearing what you think. Yes. I, I very much like your formulation of expanding and maturing. I think that's a beautiful way to put the, the goal. And for Israel to be true to itself, it needs to function on two levels of identity. It is the nation state of the Jewish people. It is the repository of Jewish history, of Jewish hopes. Uh, it, it has a debt of responsibility to the Jewish hinterland, to the diaspora. Uh, and that's something that, that will never disappear as long as Israel is true to itself. And at the same time, Israel has the responsibility to be the state of all of its citizens. And we Jews have to learn how to say that phrase without feeling threatened by it. And, and my sense is, Mohammed, and I, 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 I wonder if you, if you feel this in some way, that when Israeli Jews will feel that the Jewishness of the state is more secure, which I think it is. I mean, it's, it's, there was a period in the 90s when this was really an open question. I don't think it's an open question anymore. And, and the, the Jewishness of the state is now so deeply embedded in Israeli identity that I think the time has come when Jews need to internalize that and relax. And that's the place for generosity, for expansiveness and maturing. When you feel under siege, you're not capable of, of expanding and maturing. But, but a, a I think 70 plus years uh, should teach us that the Jewishness of the state won. And now it's time for the Israeliness of the state to step up. 
And we're, we're a very strange country. We don't really have an Israeli national identity. And that's, 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 that is neutral. And how do we create a neutral Israeli civic space that's, that's deeper than a civic space, that's actually a shared identity with all the problematics, but at the same time ensuring that the Jewish component of our identity uh, remains respected. And you know, it's interesting, when I look at the polls over the years of Arab Israelis, do you accept Zionism? No. Do you accept the Jewishness of the state? More so. And, it's, and, and, and it se there seems to be a, 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 an understanding that, okay, Zionism has a very negative connotation, but the Jews, the Jewish people, this is something I think ha that has been internalized at least to some extent uh, in the Arab community. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but that's really my, my impression. Well, there's no question that in, in the last 72 years, and Jews and Arabs in Israel have learned to live together. We didn't master it, we didn't perfect it, uh, but Jews and Arabs, despite inheriting animosity, we're not, you know, we're not battling in the streets. Uh, you can come with your kippah and walk around my village, Iksal, and most people that will approach you will want to invite you home uh, and, and ask, how can I help you? and offer you coffee, and uh, not feel that uh, uh, you shouldn't be there. Uh, I walk around the Jewish neighborhoods all over the country. I don't feel intimidated. I don't feel that I have to hide my Arab identity and hide my Arab uh, 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 symbols that it could be my mother with her head cover. I don't feel I have to hide it. So we, we know how to accommodate uh, each other uh, despite the differences. And despite the disagreements, and I, I, I dare to say also animosity that we inherited, but we're beginning to put that animosity with it in its sort of proper size, mm -hmm. uh, realizing that we have more that we share than we, things that we differ on. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, we know that we have a lot to build on. We have a lot to build on to create that joint Israeli mutual identity. Uh, so it's, it is building, for example, we mentioned the uh, medical industry. It's beginning to now move into the high-tech industry. It's, uh, we spoke about the crime and all those things. But there are places that we know how to work and to live with each other and tolerate and accept each other. The question, is that enough? I, I don't think so. I don't think it's enough. Those are wonderful accomplishments. They accumulate. They create a magnif magnificent size, but they are not that creating the tectonic shift in Jewish Arab relations. The tectonic shift has to be mutual legitimacy. For me to feel that I'm a legitimate citizen, when it comes, when the state and the Jewish majority feels so comfortable in the Jewishness that they will pass the nation state law, it's, it's, it's a, it is a very insulting kind of action. It shows that the Jews are not mature enough, they're not expanding enough, they're not responsible enough to manage a modern proper state. So yes, I am hoping and I have, I'm hoping a thousand years down the road, ultimately the, the Jews will mature to fulfill the role of a responsible majority. Can we, can we reduce that time frame a little bit? I That'd hope so, I <laughs> hope so for the sake of my children and future grandchildren. But uh, uh, I think that what we need to identify <coughs> is how do we focus on the 97% that we can do together now and the 3% that we disagree on, on issues of identity, identity of the state or identity of the public space, put that in the right perspective, put it maybe in some kind of parking mood for one or two generations, maybe until we resolve, <coughs> maybe until we resolve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but meanwhile accumulate that 97% of success. In, in every corner, whether it is in a joint housing uh, 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 situation as you live in, or in a joint medical team that works in fighting the corona, or in joint construction team 
that also knows how to sit and have hummus together. We have a lot of ways to cooperate, but we have to take it also to the higher floor, which is governance. Arab citizens have to be seen as legitimate partners in running the state and not only to be on the status of consumers, that we consume services, equal or not equal from the state. Mm -hmm. We want to be shareholders to sit around the board of directors of this corporation called the State of Israel. So how do we do that when, for a majority of Jews, the current configuration of Arab politicians are seen by and large as defenders, apologists for terrorism, uh, are so fundamentally mistrusted? I can flip the question to you. Wait, how this, are, okay. how, many of, how many Israeli Jewish politicians are seen by the eyes of Arab citizens? And, and both sides are right. <laughs> and I think, I think when we say both sides are right, we realize that it's a glass ceiling that we can see beyond, and we know what's beyond that and what we have to address. I'll say that a glass ceiling is better than a cement ceiling because at least we know what we're facing. And as we talk through these issues, we know that we still face many challenges. But as we're looking towards the end of our session, I want to ask both of you to go back to the start and to maybe reiterate or maybe bring in something new that you think we, the opportunity presents itself at this particular time and where we have to move forward on that opportunity. Uh, you started saying something, Muhammad, around that opportunity. I'm going to give it to Yassi and, and end off with you. Well, look, I have my criticisms, deep criticisms, of the politicians who represent the Arab community. But on bottom, the onus, the primary responsibility is on the Jewish majority. And the responsibility is on us to reassure the Arab minority, that we see you as part of our society and more deeply as part of our identity. That when I say the word Israeli, I don't really mean Jewish, whether I say it or not, that's the assumption. Israeli equals Jewish. And that was the deep offense uh, of the nation state law. The deep offense not only to the Arab community, to my mind, the deep offense to Israeli identity. It was a profound violation of the promise of the Israeli Declaration of Independence to be simultaneously the state of the Jewish people and the state of all of its citizens. That's there. You don't have to be a great Talmudist to, to, to see what the founders, the framers of the Declaration of Independence intended. That nation state law betrays the promise of, of the state of Israel and, and it is a disgrace. And so the first step, the first step to take advantage of this moment should be a discussion within the Jewish majority, reopening the nation state law. And I would say not to cancel it, but to, but to amend, it. amend it. Yes. Thank you very much, Yossi. I would, you know, I would say that actions are louder than words. Mm. And I think that uh, uh, what needs to be done is more Israelization of Israel de facto. And the Israelization of Israel uh, is, is happening now, or maybe uh, uh, not seen by everyone, but I'll give you a couple of examples. There's higher and higher percentage of Arab students in Israeli universities. Today it's about 18% of the student population. And if we reach the size of the Arab citizens, which is 21%, it means that Israeli universities have become true representation of the fabric of society. This changes the dynamics of studentship, of how an Israeli Jewish student experiences academic life. It's happening also in the high-tech industry. In the last five years, the percentage of Arab <coughs> percentage of Arab citizens in high-tech increased from 2% to 7% in five years. Mm -hmm. So the high-tech industry is beginning also to learn how to become Israeli, reflecting the uh, proportion of Arab citizens into society, and we're moving in the right direction there. Uh, today, there's almost uh, 1,200 
schools in Israel that have what we call cross-sector teachers. Arab teachers yes. teaching in Jewish schools and Jewish teachers teaching in Arab schools. They have about 400,000 Israeli kids that are beginning to learn through the teacher from what we call the other side that becomes part of their norm, that becomes a, a person that they look up to, a person that knows how to reward them with a grade or punish them with a grade. It's a new relationship that they've never tested before. Parents that they know that their teacher, the teacher of their kids, is from the other side, that they're giving them skills on how to, to become a better human being. I think this interaction where we go deeper and deeper in, 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 in working together, in living together, this is the Israelization process that I think that Israel is going, despite the government, sometimes with the assistance of the government, but I think the more we feed those type of uh, programs and activities on the ground, the better sex chances we have of, of creating, yes, a different Israel, but a realistic Israel. I mean, maybe it's not the ideological dream of Ben Gurion and Herzl, uh, but it's the, the Israel that is learning how to walk its real path. Uh, it's a path that I think that the founders of the state saw in, in the Declaration of Independence. They even spoke about it in the Declaration of Independence. They wrote it in the Declaration of Independence. And I think that to translate that into action is the way forward. Yes, the, the legislation approach is, is also critical. I mean, there are obstacles in, in, the, in the process of uh, integration and in the process of partnership and equality. And, and we have to be able to also bring about change of government so that the legislation will suit what's happening on the ground between Jews and Arabs. And many of those initiatives that you're talking about are educational initiatives, that uh, the audience for that are students and children around Israel, Jews and Arabs alike, who really have to learn what a shared society means and how their identity and the other's identity really corresponds with each other and allows for a shared society. I want to thank you both very much for an inspiring conversation. I want to thank you for not agreeing with each other on everything, but voicing your independent voices and uh, making sure that we understand more fully and deeply what a challenge it is to create a shared society here in Israel, even or despite or actually during a time of a global pandemic. Thank you, Yassi. Thank you, Mohammed, And uh, thank you all for being with us. Thank you. Thank you.